My name is Peter Isaacs. I was born here in Yarmouth 80 years ago, and a few days ago went out to the Needles Lighthouse aboard Dave Kennett's boat Dunlin. Dave is probably uh, Yarmouth's best known resident. He's now 82 years of age. Uh, he's a former mayor of the town, a member of the Harbour Commission, and between 1971 and 1995 he was the coxswain of the Yarmouth lifeboat. My brother Tony uh, is 84 years of age and he was for more than 40 years uh, a contractor to Trinity House to service the Needles Lighthouse. By servicing that means on uh, replacement and supplying them with whatever they needed for maintenance and so on. In the latter period he stood keeper of the Needles Lighthouse and of the Nerg Tower. I thought it was a good idea to get these two old salts together to talk about their uh, youth and uh, their time working in the western waters of the, uh, the Solent and also uh, Caroline Dudley who is a, a local historian. I learned uh, a few weeks ago that she'd never been to Scratchwell's Bay so she came along too and could put us right on the historical facts. So this is a tale of the three of us actually as we all went to the same school in Freshwater uh, in the 1950s. Uh, what we got up to as uh, young lads and then Tony and Dave as what they got up to uh, as adults. So here goes. We began our journey from Yarmouth Harbour aboard Dave Kennett's boat Dunlin. <music> on leaving the harbour we passed Fort Victoria on our left and carried on through the narrow gap between the Isle of Wight and Hearst Castle on the mainland. Then on past Fort Albert and down towards the Needles via Colwell and Totland Bay. After rounding the Needles Lighthouse, we reached our first discussion point, Scratchell's Bay. This, this bay, old uh, Scratchell's Bay, and they think it was called that after the devil who was old Scratch or Mr. Scratch. Ah, <laughs> and it's because of the dangers of the bay and you know if you get too close you could get in a lee shore um, wind and get blown in to the bay. So, uh, do you really want to know the, why it's called Scratchell's Bay? I well, can tell you. No, it's nothing to do with what it's you It's got to do with the devil. <laughs> what, what, what happened was there was a married couple in Livington who didn't get on. And the woman used to say, when you're dead, she said, I'm coming up the graveyard, jump on your grave every day. So he left it in his will that he'd be buried in the little bay behind the needles. And his name was Bob Scratchell. That's where they get the name from. Yeah. I don't care what anybody else says. Two theories there. Uh. <laughs> Two theories, <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> needles Lighthouse is behind which was uh, built in 1859. It was demanned in 1994. Tony Isaacs, who's sitting down there, the contractor at the Trinity House for over 40 years to serve as the lighthouse. Before that, Vic Stannard serviced the lighthouse and Dave Kennett, who's at the helm and whose boat we're on, worked for Vic, so he was servicing the lighthouse as well. The original lighthouse was up the top of the cliffs over there, which was built in 1786 and deactivated when the new lighthouse came on stream in 1859. There was one uh, murder committed there when a lighthouse keeper, Thomas Coleraine, was thrown off the top of the cliffs to his death presumably by some smugglers, and Thomas Coleraine was the great, great, great grandfather of Tony and myself. Uh, Caroline, I think uh, his wife continued to man the lighthouse. Yeah, she for did for a few years, years yeah. Yes. Right. On her own, yeah, with all her children. Mm. For a year. Exactly. Well, that was in uh, November 1832. I th the book I've read says his body was never recovered, but I thought he was buried in a freshwater churchyard. Oh yes, there is a gravestone. Yeah. Yes, it's good. Yes. It's just a memorial. So maybe he was uh, recovered. 
The Needles Lighthouse uh, was pre-assembled on Totland Beach and brought out uh, for assembly on the end uh, of the rocks. Uh, the contractors were the Conway brothers from, uh, from Totland. Uh, I've got a photograph here of the structure they built to uh, take the stones off the barge and uh, gradually assemble them. Um, I don't know how long it took, Caroline, but uh, presumably a year or so to um, Well, yes, it took a couple of years to um, cut the chalk to make a platform for the lighthouse. So they started in 1854, and it wasn't until July 1857 that they laid the first foundation stone. Dave was the coxswain of the Yarmouth lifeboat uh, from 1971 until 1995 and yep. uh, he won't uh, tell us but I will uh, tell you he got a silver medal from the RLI for bravery and later on a bronze medal. Uh, he was then made an MBE uh, shortly after his retirement in 1995. He was Man of the Year uh, around about that time and also appeared on uh, This Is Your Life. But Dave, if you could perhaps tell us uh, about a couple of the uh, rescues that you made around here, perhaps the first one with the policeman. Yes, um, the uh, flares were sighted by the Needles Coast Guard at the time and uh, it was um, blowing uh, sort of a force seven or uh, less from the southeast, and uh, five London policemen decided to head for the Needles. And uh, a, uh, as they got to the Needles, about 11 o'clock that evening, uh, they were in such rough. The, the wind had turned round to the north, and uh, they were in such bad conditions and uh, they couldn't handle that um, they fired many flares and we followed the flares 14 miles out into the channel. Five hours out, they sailed into an unexpected gale. Plowing through the raging seas on your way to the rescue, you were desperately searching for the stricken yacht in ever worsening conditions. It was a miracle you spotted us in a severe storm and enormous seas. The skipper David Abbott, his crew, John Peck, and Keith Bateman, <laughs> David Morgan, and Richard Foster English. <laughs> <laughs> well, we do have an artist's impression of the scene. Now, David, uh, spotting the yacht was one thing, but getting alongside was quite another. Yes, well, the, the lifeboat had chased us for some hours, and it was uh, pretty rough out there. The waves were probably as high as a house, and one moment uh, the lifeboat was as high as that above us, and the next moment vice versa. And bringing the lifeboat alongside us was quite a feat in skill and seamanship. But he did that twice. Uh, first of all, to take the three lads on my left off, and they were like uh, Olympic jumpers, just leaping onto the boat to be held on by the, the crew. And then the boat got wrenched away, and David came back for John and I, and again, we couldn't get off quick enough. <laughs> what can we say, David? Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> And strangely enough, uh, because it was blowing hard northerly, they battened the boat down and she was um, later found going down through the uh, orderly race um, about 12 hours later and recovered. So if they'd so, stayed aboard, they might have been all right. <laughs> You're right, Peter, if they'd stayed, yeah. <laughs> she was a very, she was a very, um, steady boat. It was a very sailable boat, but when they left uh, St. Var, it was only about a force five and uh, the, just the wind changed and they were caught out. That was the, uh, that was that rescue. I used to go down to the old Coast Guard station with the old Coast Guard people, officers, and I, I remember them signalling all the, because they were the Lord Signal Station, and they signalled all the ships because in those days there was only shortwave radio through Dighton. But they talked to all the ships through with an order now that all, everything that passed down through the needles. So I was fortunately up there, and of course, at the same at the same time, 
they used to have the north cone and the south cone gale. So if there was going to be a gale uh, from the south, they'd put the south cone up. Right. And that was interesting. And so I learned a lot up there at the, uh, with the needles. And it was the... Um, when I joined the lifeboat, of course, we were still... We, we were tail end of the order slam and we uh, and uh, the shortwave radio through Nighton. So um, it, was, it took a long... It was, uh, I think, in the late 60s when the VHF and UHF radio came along. And then so everyone could talk to everyone. The most recent decent wreck we've had in the Isle of Wight, which is in January 1947, off the uh, the needles there, uh, Greek steamer at the Varvasi uh, stopped her engines in thick fog to pick up a pilot, and for unknown reasons managed to drift onto the bridge uh, rocks, uh, where she eventually uh, broke up. But that uh, had a bonus for the local people because she had on board tangerines, which in 1947, of course, we hadn't seen for many years. It had some awful wine, which tasted like drain cleaner, although I was only six at the time, but Tony was four years older, so I'm sure he had a mouthful or two. Um, there's still a few artifacts uh, round about uh, in Yarmouth. Dave has got the oldest lamp. Uh, his father had the steering wheel, but Tony and I have got spokes from the after steering wheel, which are quite big. We have a few uh, little uh, tales to tell about the rocket site, which is up there. In 1956, Saunders Row leased the land from uh, the War Department uh, in response to a government requirement to develop uh, a missile and the rocket site uh, was started to be built in uh, 1956. George Weeks was the contractor and dug out most of the chalk. Dave was living in the Coast Guard cottages uh, just behind uh, them and uh, I was living in Allen Bay and of course at weekends there were no uh, personnel on site but they left all their equipment behind including dumper trucks uh, a crane, I remember, and various other bits and pieces. And Dave and I, I think we learned to uh, drive heavy goods vehicles uh, up there at the weekends. These days, of course, the kids would have driven the trucks over the cliff, but we weren't that bad. <laughs> well, I do remember one of us, I'm not sure who it was, uh, drove over a manhole cover and managed to get... What? You! No, 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 no. <laughs> managed to get the wheel out of the front of the back stuck in the manhole cover. Uh, in the manhole, so we decided that, that was enough for the weekend and, and left. Uh, eventually, of course, uh, security was brought in with the Alsatian dogs and that put an end to our uh, playing around at the rocket site, but those were good days. I remember getting into one of the, uh, the the huts, which was an office, got in through a window, and there were all the plans, some of which were marked secret, which I thought was quite extraordinary at the time. <laughs> Later on, over that way, off Pebble Point, you were involved in the rescue from a uh, railroad uh, cargo boat. Right. Yes, the, um, the uh, Alquather got into trouble. Increasing storm force 10 imminent. This is Southern Coast Guard now. Yeah, what time did you hear that transmission of A day, over? DJ Alquaz here, Alquaz here, please. Yes, I have a problem with the main engine also in uh, generators, please, over. Yeah, of course, sir. this is Poland, uh, Roger. Uh, we are getting the lifeboat to you as soon as possible. As soon as possible, stand by. Um, it was the second hurricane. We went out uh, in the first hurricane in 87, but this was the 89 hurricane, and uh, we made our way down to the ship that was um, in trouble of swanage. Hey, I'm a flight boat, this is Hotchkirk, hello. This is a young flight boat. 
here. Collins has just put out a gale warning for Dover White. Southwesterly 8, increasing storm 10 imminent. Over. Oh, that's really my mind, Mike. Yep, OK then, thanks so much. She um, had one anchor down, no engines, uh, engine failure. Al Quater, Al Quater, Portland Coast Guard. Any change in your situation, Alan? Uh, uh, Alan Quater, Portland Coast Guard. Uh, we went to um, to perform a rescue and they didn't want to come off so we hovered around and eventually went to, we went ashore and took all the crew ashore and um, we uh, then went into the hotel and got more chaps bedded down and about past 12 that night um, the telephones and bells rang and we launched and uh, this time we left the lifeboat alongside of the of the pier at Swanage and uh, on going down there we pounded um, uh, quite a lot of pounding and split the fuel tank in the lifeboat which was pretty well unknown because these tanks are really built so you can tell what the conditions were like and we uh, eventually went out we got alongside yeah, Alcoy, uh, Alcoy, the Yarmouth lifeboat just remain calm and we'll assess the situation when we get there Okay, uh, control, 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 uh... No power on board at all. They had both anchors down and they were rolling very badly. And the wind had dropped to force 10 and we took, started to take the crew off over the stern on a cargo net. She was um, ranging up and down at some time, you can see the propeller, and then um, about 30 feet up there, the chaps came level with us. But anyway, they came down, and one chap got hung up in the cargo net, and uh, so I decided that rather than kill them, I, I thought that be, <laughs> they'd be better off if they had the helicopter. So with, they um, fortunately they had the Sikorsky helicopter at Leon Solent with Peter Thompson as the pilot and uh, eventually they came out and we guided the uh, helicopter on with our searchlights and uh, and they uh, performed and took the rest of the chaps off and we headed back for Yarmouth. We were out for 18 hours on that trip so uh, they were um, the next day that a tug came along and towed the whole ship back to Southampton. And for that you received a bronze, bronze medal. Bronze medal. And I think uh, Joe Lester and Bob <coughs> Cook received commendations as well. Yes they did. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, Talk, talking of fires, Dave, uh, I think that you and Tony were uh, in some distress over on Christchurch at yeah. some stage when you were young men didn't have any flares and had to resort to uh, oily rags set fire. Dave and I are old friends, we've known each other a year or two, yeah. and we went down to Christchurch some years ago to pick up a boat, and, uh, uh, and we came out of the harbour, out into the uh, Solent, and um, it was a petrol paraffin engine. Now I don't know if people are familiar with these things, but you had to warm the engine up on petrol to get it to run smoothly on paraffin. Well, eventually we ran out of petrol trying to get this blessed paraffin engine to run, and and we were in trouble. And um, I, uh, a toaster went by, and now I don't know if people are aware of it, but one of the um, standard rescue signals is to wave your coat on the end of a boat hook, which we did. And I stood up with this great long boat hook, waved the coat as the coaster went by. The chap came out of the bridge. And he waved back and kept going. When the, the lifeboat was informed that there was a problem, I think. Well, leading up to this, of course, um, we did have to burn lo uh, 
all the rags on the floor deck, but we also burnt floorboards. We bur took off locker doors and burnt them up on the floor deck to make as much smoke as possible. And luckily, the, the, um, the curator of the museum, uh, I think they even spoken to him earlier on said, and, and gave him an indication of what we planned to do. And, and he saw it, he saw the smoke, I think he probably recognised the paper. And, and, and he called out the Yarmouth lifeboat. But yet Harold said, Bloomin' Nippers, they shouldn't be out there in this weather. And he wasn't going to come. Oh, no. Bloomin' Nippers, they should know better. He, he wasn't going to come. But in the end, I think the secretary fired the maroon, so he had to come. But that's not the end of the story. When he eventually found us, he steamed by us at about 10 knots. And the bowman, who was a chap called Brian Pomeroy, a friend of ours, he threw the blessed bow rope. And he kept going, he didn't stop to give me time to make fire. If I'd have put the loop of the rope over the front of the, um, the boat, it would have pulled the front of the boat out. So I let it go, I threw it again. And of course, this really upset the cops and Harold. Really, anyway, he eventually came round and then everything went smoothly after that. But uh, oh, it was a day to remember, it really was. I was feeling as sick as a dog, of course, and didn't help. And we had another old gentleman on board, he was sick as well. And he was, he was passed out, he was laid in the, in the Belgian. What was his name? Oh, meaning. Meaning, meaning, meaning. Oh, sorry, his name was Meaning, lovely old chap. Uh, anyway, another episode in our life. Another wreck of note occurred right in there, which was the uh, largest sailing ship which has uh, been lost on the shores of the Isle of Wight in January uh, 1890 the uh, Irex. Uh, she was on her maiden voyage to South America with a cargo of steel pipes or iron pipes. She'd been uh, trying to get uh, to, uh, away from the, the, the coastline for a whole two weeks and the crew were in a pretty mutinous frame of mind. Anyway, the skipper misread the needle's light. They came in here and uh, the Totland lifeboat uh, tried to get alongside, but was unable to do so. Uh, Cox and uh, Stone, the crew were pretty unhappy about that apparently, and uh, it is said that they refused to serve with him afterwards. Uh, the 27 were rescued, there were 35 altogether, so the others were drowned. They were taken up onto the cliffs by Breach's boy. She is still over there, and I think, Tony, you've dived on the wreck. When I dived on that area, um, I thought, good God, there's a mast still here. But of course, idiot, it wasn't a wooden mast, was it? It was the cast iron pipes, that part of the cargo that the ship was carrying. And they're still there on the seabed now. And at the price of scrap iron now, I'm absolutely amazed. At, the... at the moment, we're right on the top of the IREX wreck. And... Yeah. And um, yep. the, to find it, you look down at the moat, the wall of the moat, and it just have Pepper's Rock just opening. You can see the distance from here to the top of the cliff where the breeches boy was attached. So it's uh, a very long uh, haul to get anybody from here up to the top of the cliff. The breeches boy rescue was the longest and highest ever recorded. It was done by the Coast Guard rescue teams and by the troops at the, the batteries for the Royal Artillery. Um, many of them were invited to Osborne House to meet Queen Victoria afterwards. Uh, one particular note was that a cabin boy, they couldn't bring him off uh, when most of the rescue occurred, so they wrapped him in a blanket and tied him up to the mast, left him there overnight, went back and got him the next morning. He was still alive. Tony was telling us about the the time he went into one of the caves uh, in the main bench down there. Uh, Tony, if you would uh, recall what happened, you took somebody ashore? This, this could be slightly embarrassing, no, but don't, don't I'm me. not easily embarrassed. Um, I had a young lady on board a boat one day and we anchored off where these caves were and I went ashore in a little boat. And we were in there for about 20 odd minutes or so and suddenly freshwater rescue turned up. They tore in round the... Obviously somebody had report, reported that this boat was in trouble and they could see no body on board. But they eventually found a body in the cave. That was me and the young lady. 
I went, like, oh, do you want to go any deeper? Into Fully that? dressed, I take it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Too much information. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It was Lord Hope's father. That, the, the, there were two caves there, Lord Hope's father and Lord Hope's kitchen. Uh, I think a, a French prisoner of war once took refuge at the kitchen, I think, for, no, for a, a while. Another one, Frenchman's Hole, that's right. Yeah, Frenchman's Hole. The name the Needles is believed to date back to the 15th century. There were originally four rocks making up the set. You can see the gap very clearly, like a missing tooth. This 1646 image by Lambert Duma, a young Dutch artist, shows the third rock, known as Lot's Wife, before it became needle-like. At 120 feet, it was the tallest of the four. It suffered a spectacular collapse in the great storm of November 1772. Those who lived nearby heard the crash. Despite its demise and the relatively squat shapes of the surviving rocks, the name the needles stuck. Interestingly, the publication of this video marks the 250th anniversary of the rock's collapse. The combination of boats and the needles is not a happy mix, with the bridge and goose rock being just two obstacles ready to catch the unwary, as happened with the Valvasi. Now, just on the other side of the needles is the goose rock. Two Royal Navy frigates have gone on to the goose rock, which is very, very close to the lighthouse, um, HMS Assurance, in 1752, which is a 44-gun frigate, and then uh, in 1811, the 38-gun frigate HMS Pomo. Very embarrassing to the Royal Navy that they lost two ships on the same rock. As Peter has pointed out, the combination of boats and the needles is not a happy mix, with the bridge and Goose Rock being just two obstacles ready to catch the unwary, as happened with the Varvasi. Unfortunately, the Varvasi itself added to the problems because parts of the ship remain west of the needles and are perilously close to the surface, ready to snag any unwary sailors. This video, taken at low tide, illustrates just how dangerous this obstruction is. Carry them Despite being clearly marked on paper and electronic charts, sailors regularly hit the underwater obstructions. One such instance involved the classic yacht Alchemist, which was taking part in the annual Round the Island race. It hit the Varvasi, was badly holed, and sank relatively quickly, despite the very prompt attention of the RNLI who filmed this rescue. If you know where the deep water is and where the underwater obstacles are, it's possible to transit between the first and second and the second and third rocks, depending on the tide. It's quite rare to see anyone do this, but both Tony and Dave have been doing so since they were teenagers. About 50 years ago, Dave was paid £500 to drive a boat at high speed between the rocks as part of an advert for Canada Dry. Before he sold his boat last year, Peter wanted to drive between the rocks for one last time. Today, we're taking it more slowly being careful to avoid the stump of Lot's wife to our left and the remains of the stack to our right.
Originally, there were two uh, quick-firing guns installed here, intended to be able to defend against fast motor torpedo boats coming down the Solent. But they found that the guns were unsuitable and the gun ports were unsuitable, so eventually it just became searchlights. And they were used uh, up to and including the Second World War. Uh, there is a lift shaft and Dave, uh, in his youth, came down in the lift when it was still there. Uh, when a chap called Pat Newman was the, uh, the water department caretaker. Uh, that's where all the water for the needles batteries above uh, come from. And Caroline's grandfather was the battery sergeant major uh, during the Second World War up with a new battery up the top, which had got uh, three, I think, uh, 9.2 guns, never fired in anger. Uh, that they were intended to defend the needle channel against uh, the invasion. Of course, originally it was the French, but of course, World War I and two Germans. Summer of 1946, it was the first um, summer after the war. Uh, I was uh, four years old at the time, and I do remember it was a sunny day and there was one hell of a bang in Allen Bay. It was one of those days when the fog was streaming over the downs so that you couldn't actually see the downs and the fog um, was from the south to the north and sweeping into Allen Bay. There were a lot of people around and the uh, coach park uh, was full of coaches when this bang occurred and uh, shortly thereafter I suppose the uh, fire brigade arrived but I don't remember that. I remember distinctly uh, one or two body parts. Um, it was a mosquito of the Fleet Air Arm which had flown that day from Leon Solent, had uh, obviously uh, run into the cliff because it couldn't see it with the fog. Most of the wreckage fell over the cliff. Uh, this is a uh, piston from one of the uh, engines, um, they were Merlin engines, the same as they were in the Spitfire. Uh, and actually, you know, it's an ill wind that blows nobody any good because if I remember rightly, the engines had three bladed propellers and they were aluminium. And of course, in those days, the scrap uh, value was quite high. And um, over the years, uh, Tony and I recovered quite a lot of the scrap from that uh, wreck and uh, managed to sell it to the scrap metal dealer in Cowes. Um, other people did the same. But you kept the piston. But I kept the piston, yes. And Tony's got another one. Uh, if you go along the bottom of the cliffs nowadays, I think the only thing that is visible is one of the long barreled uh, cannon. Uh, which was in the wings of the plane, but uh, there's nothing left of anything else. Anyway, it was a tragedy. We're now heading to what is probably the most visited beach on the island, Allen Bay. Behind us now are the famous coloured sands of uh, Allen Bay. It's unique, of course, in that the strata is uh, vertical, whereas the strata of everything else around is horizontal. Uh, we won't go into the, uh, the history of that, it's far too complex. But collecting coloured sands has been going on for many years. Caroline knows a little bit about it. Well, yes, even before Victorian times, people were coming down collecting the sand and um, putting them into little vials and selling them as chimney piece ornaments and uh, beautiful designs were made in uh, the local scenes actually in the glass jars um, so yeah this goes back to Joseph Cotton he is said to have um, brought up the idea but other people made pictures of uh, the sand it's called, it's called Marma Tinto so of local pictures of local scenes. They're very small, like the size of a postcard, and those used to be sold as um, souvenirs, as well as the uh, little bottles. Um, and then this continued for quite a few years. People used to collect their own sand, but it was very dangerous, and some people unfortunately got killed in uh, cliff falls, so that it was prevented uh, about the 70s. Yeah. 
Um, so yeah, somebody called Jock Perkis came over here on a day trip in the 50s and um, he revived the collecting of the sand and there was a little shop on the beach where you could collect all the different colours, it's about 25 different shades and make your own. Yeah, so... Um, I remember. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's only nine different colours, but many, many shades. shades. There is yeah. no blue, no so blue. if you see blue anywhere, yes. it's fake. Yes. <laughs> also behind, you'll see the uh, ground station of the chairlift, which was uh, installed in 1971. The Royal Needles Hotel Company raised uh, £25,000 to build it. Uh, and thought that it would probably take them 15 years to uh, repay the money. In fact, they repaid it in two years because within 11 years of its building, nine million people had travelled on that chairlift. Wow. You see now at high water, the whole of the uh, station is uh, in the sea. When it was built, uh, it only ever had uh, water around the seaward end. Now this is not, I suspect, because of sea level rises, it's because the beach has receded. Uh, the Isle of Wight, of course, is subject to considerable erosion. Beyond the chairlift, you can see traces of white sand. Uh, this was the site of a, a thriving industry, uh, which, again, Caroline knows rather more than I do. In the late 1700s, the Uri family of Yarmouth were mining the sand. Um, and there were two jetties, I've actually got a photograph from the 1860s, there was two jetties coming out and the sand was put into boats and taken round to Yarmouth where, the, where there was a sand house and it was stored there and dried and then it was taken across to Bristol and London for the um, glass making industry and also some of it was made into early porcelain. Um, but so uh, yeah, Wedgwood didn't actually use any himself. It wasn't. It didn't burn pure enough. So he wanted the very white um, porcelain. Um, so yeah, and that's uh, in the 1800s. Um, the George Ward bought the land around here of uh, Northwood House. He bought a lot of the land and he rented out the sand pits to the Squire Brothers of Yarmouth, and they continued the business. But in the 1860s, it was much cheaper to get the sand from France. So the business died down. Um, and where um, Hedden Hall is, that used to be where the sand workers' cottages were. But uh, it was uh, Ward converted it into a dwelling um, in the 1860s. And so I think some of the old sand workers' cottages are incorporated into Hedden Hall. There have been more than one pier built in Allen Bay. The last uh, pier of any size, not this little jetty, uh, uh, was finally um, wrecked by a storm and I think in 1924? Uh, 28. 1928. Yes, yeah. um, our grandfather uh, and great-grandfather uh, was the pier master uh, of the pier here and of Topman Pier. Uh, he was dual-hatted. Yeah, the first pier was built in 1869 by the Allen Bay um, Estate Company and uh, they built it uh, just after the big hotel which has now gone because it burnt down in 1910 unfortunately but there was a huge hotel on the cliff top um, that was at the beginning of the development of Topland and Allen Bay and uh, the first pier proved so popular um, but it was only made of wood so in uh, 1887 they built another pier in virtually the same place uh, with iron supports and uh, that's the one that was uh, sadly uh, destroyed in the storm in um, 1928, as I said, yeah, February 1928. You're breaking your dates. <laughs> right, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, so that was uh, the end of the pier, but uh, yeah, it was very popular in its day, a lot of uh, paddle steamers came here, uh, day trippers. Another uh, important historical uh, point about here is the um, Marconi and his experiments at the turn of the uh, 19th, 20th century. Uh, he set up uh, an aerial at the Royal Needles Hotel and conducted a number of uh, experiments there. The first was uh, 
transmitting a signal across the billiard table in the Royal Needles Hotel, eventually to a tug here in Allen Bay, and then to uh, a larger ship. Uh, I do. But uh, Tony's and my grandfather were probably the first uh, telegraph messenger boy in the world, as he used to work for a chap called Garlic, uh, who was the postmaster at Tottenham and was one of the assistants to Marconi. The reason Marconi left uh, Allen Bay was a dispute with the manager of the Royal Needles Hotel over the rental for the radio mass. So he went to the other end of the island and uh, history departed from... Uh, tonight. Yeah, yes, tonight. Yeah. Went to the mainland. Tony, any memories there? <laughs> Well, not first on memories, no, of course not. But Peter's absolutely right. The, 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 the first, the first thing, the first thing to cross the um, the um, billiard table. But the, the thing that I've always remembered is that our grandfather was his, was Marconi's messenger boy. He did all his running around for him. And actually, I think grandfather, when they built the memorial, some years after, grandfather donated five pounds towards the cost of the erection. Right. That's about all I know, really. Well, the memorial says that this spot marks the site of, and of course it does now because it's been moved three times. <laughs> We're now coming up to uh, the remaining building of the Topland RL High lifeboat station, which uh, opened in 1885, 1885 uh, and closed in 1924 when Yarmouth uh, opened. This was uh, a pulling and sailing lifeboat. Uh, and of course uh, attended, as we said before, to the wreck of the Irex. She didn't, um, when they went out to the Irex, uh, they didn't row out there or sail, uh, they were towed out there by a tub. Uh, tug. The reason it closed was uh, it was thought that a motor lifeboat, which was uh, introduced in 1924, would be better off based in Yarmouth, so this one closed. April 1908, there was a snowstorm. It was a 6,000 ton so-called protective cruiser, HMS Gladiator, coming up the so from Portland. On the outward uh, run was an American liner, the SS St. Paul, of 9,000 tons. They were both going quite fast, but spotted each other on a collision course. The St. Paul going that way turned to port, as she should have done, but for reasons not really understood, the captain of HMS Gladiator had turned to starboard. There was a collision, they were thought to be doing about three knots at the time when they hit, and the St. Paul stove in the side uh, of the Gladiator. They drifted, and in fact, the having disengaged, which of course let the water into the Gladiator, Gladiator went aground around about here. I think there were 27 sailors drowned. It was in a snowstorm, uh, even though it was April, and the soldiers from Fort, uh, Fort Victoria came out in the small boats and uh, carried out some dramatic rescues. So that was the last big um, wreck here in the Soda, 1908. Anyone walking along the beach to Yarmouth might have wondered what these two bollards are. Well, they were actually put in place by Captain Young of the Liverpool Salvage Company to assist in refloating the wreck of HMS Gladiator. With the aid of two-inch thick steel hawsers from these bollards to the ship, they were able to pull it upright. Supported by floats, it was then towed into Portsmouth Harbour. The operation took five months and cost £60,000. Sadly, it was concluded that the ship was unsalvageable and it was written off. My name's Tony Toller and I put this video together at the request of Peter who also insisted I should say a little bit about my experiences. I'm a complete newcomer to the island compared to the others. I've only been here seven years. But I have boated around the island for probably 40 years or more. The last 16 of which have been as a professional photographer running a company called BoatPhotos.co.uk. I've photographed some 20,000 boats in that time and they're all listed on my website. I've also 
done some commercial video work, uh, in particular with a company called Delta Power Boats. And I've enjoyed all that work and I've thoroughly enjoyed putting the video together for Peter. I hope you enjoyed it. Keep a lookout for part two.